because you participated in a plan with Mr. Miller to kill Noe McGraver, and your actions uh, led or helped lead to the, her death. I do not find this to be a typical juvenile murder case. This is beyond the pale. An Iowa teen will spend the next 25 years behind bars, and maybe even the remainder of his life, for his role in the cold-blooded murder of his high school Spanish teacher bringing a conclusion to a devastating case that shocked the Fairfield, Iowa community. Jeremy Goodall and his co-defendant Willard Miller both pleaded guilty in April to charges of first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit a forcible felony for the 2021 death of their teacher, Noema Graber. The ability she had to live a life that God was proud of and her selfless acts that is very hard to replace, especially for what she did for the Hispanic community in her area. It is a complete travesty to have two young people deliberately take the life of Noe McGraver away from so many. Not only was Noema robbed of 30 some years of the best, year, the best years of her life, her murder deprived Paul of the love of his life and certainly hastened his own premature death. It also had major impacts on the lives of their three children, Christian, Jared, and Noema Marie. Before a judge handed down Goodell's sentence, loved ones of Noema Graver offered heartbreaking insight into the devastation both teens caused to their family. The murderers also caused great changes in the lives of Paul and Noema's children, son Christian and daughter Noema Marie, self-supporting adults, both interrupted their lives to come home and help Paul in his illness. Christian this year has already taken more than 20 weeks unpaid leave from his job as an international medical courier in order to help his dad and after Paul's death to facilitate care for his younger brother Jared, for whom Christian has now been appointed guardian. That had not been the plan. No, Mother Noema was the rock of the family. She was the primary caregiver for Jared. She was in very good health, had a long life ahead of her. Noema <clears throat> was a truly remarkable woman. After graduating high school in Jalapa, Veracruz, Mexico, where she and Paul met when he was an exchange student, Noema became a flight attendant for Mexicana Airlines and on the side put herself through flight school, becoming one of the very first women to be licensed to fly passenger jets in Mexico. While unable to get a pilot's job in Mexico at that time, the mid-1970s, the flight crews, knowing of her qualifications, would sometimes let her fly a while. Paul was on some of those flights, and he's described to me how she might disappear during a flight for a long period of time and then finally come back bubbly and excited. She'd been flying the plane. When Paul became disabled due to the extensive nerve, nerve damage to his feet and legs from severe diabetes, Noema once again showed her strength and determination, stepping up and obtaining <clears throat> a bachelor's degree from Iowa Wesleyan and a teaching certificate in her 50s, becoming the family's primary breadwinner. Her murder thus deprived the family of its primary means of support. Noema taught for a number of years at Otomo and was in her 10th year of teaching at Fairfield High School when struck down. There she's remembered by her many hundreds of students and their families who have embedded a nearly five foot granite monument to her into the wall of the high school in a commanding position where the main hallway intersects the end hallway near her classroom. Noema Graber's son, Christian, offered a simple statement of hope toward the man who helped murder his mother. I thought a lot about what I was going to say in this moment. Mostly, I want to think about what my mother would want. And as you all know, my mother loved everybody. That includes you. And I know she wants the best for you. Even now, I know she's praying for you. Earlier today, I met both of your sisters. I gave them a hug and I told them that there's hope for you. Because I really do believe that. We had a nice conversation. And earlier, when I learned that you had a nephew, I thought about how this could impact his life. 
I have hope that your story can still be something positive. And then you and I had that conversation two Fridays ago when we sat down together. I was very happy to have that conversation with you. The reason why is because I really do believe that you that you feel bad for what you did and, and, and I believe in you and I do forgive you. So the main focus in my opinion is if just moving forward you do the best you can to be the best man you can be so you can redeem yourself. Because a lot of people don't believe in you. But your family believes in you, your nephew, your sisters, your father. And I believe that you can be a good man. And so the main focus is moving forward is what could be positive from this story. And if you do the best you can to be a good man, just know that everything's going to be okay. Despite both Goodell and Miller being 16 years old when they beat their teacher to death, they were both charged as adults. Prosecutors say the motive of murder stemmed from a poor grade given to Willard Miller in class. Goodell told police Miller asked him for his help in killing his teacher, and he agreed to do it. Both teens confessed to their plot. That consisted of ambushing and beating Graber while she was on her daily walk. An Iowa judge handed down Miller's sentence of 35 years to life back in July. But during Goodell's sentencing hearing, the chilling and heinous circumstances surrounding Graber's death were relived once again. After Graber's death, investigators were able to piece together the puzzle. When a former acquaintance of the teens pointed investigators to their social media posts, basically confessing to the crime. What was his pattern of life there on, on Snapchat? Was he pretty close to the chest with information or did he talk a lot? He talked a lot. Who did he talk to? With the Snapchat regarding the murder, he talked to both John Burnett. He talked to Ben Bauer, who on Snapchat was Ben Bauer and some numbers. And he talked to Mr. Awesome Dude, which was later determined to be Jack Girl. And Jack and Ben were gaming buddies of his. Not local. Correct. Would it be uh, fair to state that um, Jeremy made some sort of a, of a confession over Snapchat to his gaming buddies? Yes. Um, we've previously reviewed State's Exhibit 128. Um, that's the photograph of what appears to be Mr. Goodale stating, point of view, you're my, snap, you're my Spanish teacher, and this is the last thing you see. Are you familiar with that Snapchat? Yes. How did that develop? Uh, it was obtained through the Snapchat search warrant and the results that were provided by, Sna uh, provided by Snapchat to us. So these were provided from Snapchat themselves and not from uh, his phone or another means? There were pictures on his phone, too. Investigators say Graber was initially reported missing. Then on November 3rd, 2021, police discovered her body in a park covered by a tarp and wheelbarrow. During the search of the park, the police were able to, uh, they basically did a grid search. Uh, what kind of stood out to them was they saw a red object in the woods, which later turned out to be a wheelbarrow. Um, once they got close to a wheelbarrow, they could see uh, essentially a shoe, that looked like a foot in a shoe underneath a tarp. And uh, this area, it, you just found Melania Graver's body in this area because of the grid search, is that correct? That's correct. Not because of anything Jeremy Goodale or Willard Miller informed you of, is that right? That's right. We actually moved down off the railroad tracks past the wheelbarrow, and now you're looking up towards the railroad tracks. And this just kind of represents on uh, how uh, the attempt was made to conceal her with. You now you see the, the tarp, you see the wheelbarrow, and the railroad tie. Okay, so the tie, the tarp, and the wheelbarrow are all covering or concealing Melinda Graber's body? That's correct. Police quickly ruled out any of Graber's loved ones as suspects, but within hours of her body being discovered, more pieces to the puzzle were put together. Was Mr. Graber ruled out as a suspect in this case? Yes. How so? His alibi uh, was confirmed later on. Um, the second thing about Mr. Graber is when we called him back for an interview at the law center, uh, Paul Graber was in a boot. Uh, just the exertion of physically walking from the parking lot to the law center was taxing on him. Um, the terrain of the murder scene, he wouldn't have been able to, one, either carry Noema Graber or even walk along that trail in his condition.
We previously reviewed uh, photographs of the crime scene. Um, it's a relatively steep embankment there. Yes. Pretty rocky. Yes. Mr. Graper physically would have had difficulty uh, navigating that terrain. Yes. Okay. Um, could you, so it was reported as a missing person. Yes. At a certain point, it transitioned into a homicide. Yes. Um, how long did it take between the body being found on the, on the side of the tracks there and Mr. Goodale being taken into custody? Approximately 10 and a half hours. And Agent Lavaletta has kind of discussed the investigative steps. Were you there and present uh, during the course of uh, the acts and events that Agent Lavaletta discussed? All except for the processing once the DCI agents started processing the different crime scenes. I'd been up for 26 hours, so I've gone home at that point. Were you able to develop a, a theory or a, as to Mr. G Goodale's motive of the killing of Mrs. Graber? Yes. Could you discuss that? Uh, Chayden Miller was basically flunking Spanish. He wanted to be, go on a, he wanted to go to Spain um, that summer to build his college resume. He couldn't get into the exchange program without a passing grade in Spanish. Uh, so he came up with the idea of killing Mrs. Graber because she was flunking him in Spanish um, and asked Jeremy Goodell to assist him. In the what murder. was the relationship between Chade and Miller and Jeremy Goodell? They'd been friends since grade school. And it's your understanding that this was Chaden Miller's idea? Yes. And Jeremy Gildale was asked to assist? Yes. What did Jeremy say when he was asked? He said yes right away. So to the extent there, the motive existed, it was mostly Chaden's motive, correct? Yes. What was Jeremy's um, reasons for assisting or following through? To quote his words, he didn't want to, quote unquote, be a p In a 2023 police interview after taking his plea, Goodell revealed the gruesome details of how the murder went down in his eyes. So I just knocked Zoe's pipe off the table and broke it, and um, her baby had died. She was getting ready to go home, and I said, yeah, that's great. And then uh, that's when Chayden came to the park, and I said, hold up. been thinking
Lieutenant Julie Kinsella says the Fairfield community was left in shock, but she noted Goodell never showed remorse or any type of guilt for his role in the murder. That being the case, did the defendant make any statements or admissions while in the uh, interview room at the Fairfield Police Department? Yes. At one point, he's talking with his sister, Jacqueline. Um, she asked him how 
if she, he's in shock, how he's not freaking out. Um, he said he's not in shock. He says he's not, he doesn't feel any guilt and he feels no remorse. But before he was sentenced, his defense team had its own character witnesses speak to the court, including members of Goodell's family who expressed their sorrows to the victim's family. Introduce I'm just so sorry. The court learned more about Goodell's childhood, offering a glimpse into his life before committing the brutal murder. According to his father, Goodell changed during the 2020 pandemic. In 2020, when Jeremy was 15 years old, the COVID pandemic hit the country. How did COVID impact Jeremy's day-to-day -day routine? You know, he's, he's, he was... You know, his mom kind of abandoned him. Hey, take your time. Interpersonal relationships were so important to him. And we spent two and a half years in a global war against interpersonal interactions. It devastated him. Did COVID play a part in your decision to move Jeremy from the Maharishi school over to the Fairfield High School? Yes, sir. And why is that? Yeah. Sitting at home staring at a computer screen, there's, there's no point in paying extra money for that as far as I'm concerned. Did you feel, uh, well, let me strike that. Uh, during 2020, <coughs> during uh, the COVID pandemic, was Jeremy's entire curriculum based on online classes? For a good period of time, yes. Okay. And how was Jeremy performing with his school work uh, when everything was online? Not very well. You know, I was a single parent at that time. Um, I had to go to work, I had to provide for the family, and I was to leave a 14-year-old kid at home by himself. He had to be online because that's how they were getting their st st studies. It was another disaster, you can imagine. Um, he was not doing his work. He was, no matter what I seemed to do, since he had access to the internet, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't keep him from playing video games, and that's pretty much what he did all day. And it set up a, a terrible cycle of reprimand and then laying out what I expected from him and trying to support him every way I could and then realizing he wasn't doing what I wished. And the relationship just, it was really rough. Do you feel that the pandemic not only affected Jeremy generally, but also your relationship with your son? Definitely. Mr. Goodale, if someone were to ask you to describe your son reflecting on his entire life prior to his arrest, how would you describe Jeremy? You know, he was, he was troubled, but he was also you know, highly intelligent. He did, he did extremely well at times. So as a parent, you're hopeful and you, you kind of focus on the positives and, and hope to work toward and through, and that through the difficulty some. I realized that he, in, that, in 2021, the year this horrific crime happened, he was student of the month in April. at Fairfield High School and also the, ten the tennis MVP that same year. So is it a safe assumption that you thought Jeremy was turning a level or turning a corner with his level of maturity? I was certainly hoping so. Okay. Were you concerned about Jeremy's maturity level? Yes, I, it was very clear to me that he was probably the, in terms of emotional and intellectual maturity, he was probably at the bottom of the curve for his age group. 
When it was Goodell's sister's turn to speak, she recalled taking on the mother figure role in their household throughout her brother's childhood. But got emotional explaining how Goodell was with her own children, calling him a very good uncle. I really enjoyed seeing um, Jeremy be the older sibling type of person where he would play and take care of um, my son. They definitely... Um, Jeremy helped me a lot. I he babysat Dominic a lot for me too because I was working a twelve hour night shift weekend package in Davenport and commuting back and forth to Davenport and Fairfield. So every Monday he would definitely help. He would babysit, he would make sure that we were fed and would get food for us and he had all that energy to rough house and throw Dominic around and they, yeah, they played a lot. Would you say Jeremy's a good uncle? Yes, Jeremy's a very good uncle. And a final slew of questioning came from a forensic psychologist named Dr. Mark Cunningham. He testified about his findings on how Goodell's, quote, traumatic childhood and immaturity influenced the then 16-year-old to participate in the unthinkable. Doctor, what was your first finding regarding the developmental limitations in Jeremy's life and their relationship with this offense? So the first finding is that the brain immaturity implications of Jeremy's age of 16 at the time of the offense are fundamental to understanding the poor judgment and the faulty values that are reflected by his participation in this offense. Doctor, I think we discussed this a few minutes ago, but how were deficits in autonomy reflected in Jeremy's participation in this offense? Uh, so, uh, this is not Jeremy's problem. Chayden is failing Spanish, not Jeremy. Chayden may be impacted on going to an exchange program, not Jeremy. So, this is not Jeremy's problem. It's Chayden's problem. Well, that's a boundary issue about who does this belong to. Uh, then that, that Jeremy is so dependent on a friendship with Chayden that he can't tolerate being separated from him on this agenda, lest Chayden disapprove of him in some way. That's a boundary issue, an autonomy-related uh, issue. Um, he outsources the planning to Chayden. Wait, Jeremy, your whole life is in the balance here. This is about you and your life and your outcome. You can't outsource this to somebody else like it's not yours. Uh, so that's an autonomy-related uh, issue. Uh, subsequently, Chayden has Jeremy uh, push the, uh, the tarp and the wheelbarrow across town in the middle of the night which is certainly going to be memorable to anybody who happens to observe that. So Chayden isn't pushing the wheelbarrow and the tarp. He has Jeremy doing that. Well, Jeremy doesn't have enough theory of mind to be questioning, so how come I'm the one who's doing this? And then he doesn't have enough autonomy to say, wait, I'm getting loaded up with this responsibility. Uh, then even as Jeremy is talking about this, uh, to peers, uh, both making a statement to Zoe in advance of the offense, would you still care about me if I killed somebody, uh, then uh, informing John Burnett all about it, and then his two gaming friends. Even that compulsion to talk about this reflects an adequate autonomy of being able to hold this within himself just not enough sense of autonomy and boundaries, even to hold his own story without compulsively needing to tell other people about it. Later, he offered more insight into Goodell's state of mind when he and Miller carried out the crime. Dr. Cunningham, what did you learn about Jeremy's substance ingestion proximate to the offense? So first, in the week prior, to get some sense of what his pattern was close to the offense, uh, he reported that he was smoking an eighth of marijuana daily. 
the first thing in the morning, he would smoke either a THC vape or THC wax. And then he would get to school a little bit early and smoke marijuana with peers there. At lunch, he went to a peer's house and smoked marijuana there. After school, he smoked marijuana with another peer as they drove around. And then in the evenings, he was picked up by another peer and they would drive around and smoke weed. How about uh, Jeremy's substance ingestion the day of the offense? So he had run out of the THC wax that weekend. So his first marijuana of the day was while he is with Zoe there at the park just before this offense. And they smoked a gram and a half over a 45 minute period just prior to the offense. So he self -identif subjectively identified that he was high at the time that this began. That night after moving the body, Chayden provided alcohol and they each drank five cans of 9% alcohol hard seltzer. Uh, he knew the alcohol would put him to sleep, he described, uh, and that's what he wanted after this offense. He wanted to be put to sleep and, and be anesthetized. Cunningham explained that he believes drug abuse close to the time of the offense impacted Goodell's general judgment. However, it didn't deprive him of making a choice. It didn't deprive him of, on an absolute basis, of knowing that this conduct is wrong, but it did impact the quality of judgment and moral reasoning that he could bring to bear on this. The same quality that I would be concerned about in my airline pilot. If this is what his substance abuse uh, is the week before he walks into the cockpit to fly me home. So can Goodell be rehabilitated? Dr. Cunningham says it's possible, but the pace of his rehabilitation can't be determined today. Uh, at this point, we would be forecasting into the future about who he is in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, whatever, 25 years, whatever it is. At that point, it won't be a anticipation of the future. They will have Jeremy's track record. That parole board will have his behavior in custody. They will be able to identify uh, what, uh, what his track record has been, what his social support system is, what his employment prospects are, how positive his social orientation is. They'll have contemporaneous data about Miller releasees, about general parolees. So the, there'll be better science and more certain knowledge of who Jeremy has become and what the pace of his rehabilitation was at that time far superior to what we can forecast today. Goodell himself spoke to the court offering a tearful apology to Noema Graber's family and the community he tore apart by his actions. Video I am grateful for this chance to speak my piece. I offer my sincerest apologies to the Graber family, but I know my words will never be enough. I've had time to think on what to say, and I'm sorry, truly sorry. What I've taken can never be replaced. Every day I wish I could go back and stop myself, prevent this loss and this pain that I've caused everyone. Everyone in the community and outside of it, those closest to me and those closest to the Graper family as well as the Graper family. I didn't know how taking Ms. Graper's life would affect you. I can't comprehend losing a loved one in such an awful way. I'm sorry I didn't stop this from happening in the first place. And I'm understanding now that Ms. Graber meant so much to so many people. She was a support to the community and those close to her and she was a caregiver to her family, to her children, and to her own husband. I'm so sorry. To Mrs. Graber's friends and the members of her church, I'm truly sorry for what I've taken from you. I never stopped to consider the community. And to everyone at Fairfield High School, 
who felt unsafe, those who were scared, those who lost hope. I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm sorry how my actions have affected. And in an odd turn of events, right after he sat down, the teen killer got a bloody nose. Blood dripped down his face for several seconds before he realized what was happening. The state then offered their recommendation for sentencing. Life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years. Jeremy was approached by Tayden Miller two weeks prior to Mrs. Graber's killing. He agreed to help Tayden kill his teacher. It's not clear the level of planning and coordination that took place in the ensuing two weeks. Um, but the day before her death on November 1st, he agreed to meet up with Chayden. He did stalk Mrs. Graber along with Chayden to the scene of the crime, casing it. And in fact, I think he testified that at the, the top of the hill, they did bump into Mrs. Graber and did say hello. He didn't call off the act at that point. And he didn't call off the act when he was sitting with Zoe Fentel at the park in the 45 minutes leading up to Jaden arriving. It's unclear what the defendant's mental state was. However, there were so many opportunities for him to change his mind. Following the brutal conduct of the defendant and co-defendant co in the killing of Mrs. Graber, Mr. Goodale, um, made some serious um, uh, considerations. Um, he agreed to uh, proffer evidence against the co-defendant in this case. He agreed to um, testify against him. And he took full accountability and he pled guilty to the first degree premeditated murder of Noam Graber. And that is worthy of some consideration. Meanwhile, the defense asked the court to defer Goodell's sentencing to the Board of Parole and not set a minimum. Uh, based on all of that, we're asking, again, for the court to recognize that Jeremy Goodell is receiving the maximum punishment as provided by law, life in prison. All we are asking for is the court not to make the premature decision now as to when it will be appropriate for him to be released. The Board of Parole is in that position. If Mr. Goodale is not adequately rehabilitated, as again our sentencing memorandum indicates, the Board of Parole will make the right decision. The judge gave the last and some harsh words to Goodell before handing down his sentence. He pled guilty to first degree murder and acknowledged your actions. While you certainly have the right to exercise your constitutional rights to trial, to a jury, in a different place, um, like Mr. Miller, by pleading guilty, you spared the defendant's family, witnesses, and community a traumatic trial. And while these Miller sentencings uh, itself uh, are emotionally draining for all involved, and I doubt either Supreme Court's spent much time thinking about that toll uh, before ordering us to do hundreds of these hearings, the U.S. Supreme Court requires them. You're entitled to it. And uh, I certainly um, am required to do my job, and your attorneys have done their job very well in uh, presenting evidence. Regarding the severity of the offense, which is factor H, including any of the following, um, the commission of the murder while participating in another felony, a number of victims, and the heinous, brutal, cruel matter of murder, including whether the murder was the result of torture, I mentioned the, the offense is heinous, unusually heinous and cruel, uh, by stalking uh, Miss Graber and repeatedly hitting her with a bat. Again, I am in, I'm required to find that aggravating. And you have expressed genuine remorse that I did not see from your co-defendant. And this factor and the capacity to appreciate the criminality of your conduct, I think, is a mitigating factor. You stated that you... Um, never thought about the consequences. And I believe you when you say that, uh, when you agreed to help Willard Miller kill um, Miss uh, Nellie McRaper. Jeremy Goodall will serve out his sentence with the Iowa Department of Corrections. He won't be eligible for parole until 2048. His co-defendant Willard Miller is already serving out his life sentence. He's not eligible for parole until 2056.
Reporting for Long Crime Network, I'm Elizabeth Milner.